Welcome back everybody. This is Seed Wars number 32 and today we're going to do a review about King Nimrod. King Nimrod is one of the most important influential characters after the flood. Um, he ends up becoming all-powerful, a dictator of sorts, and he basically conquers the entire region of Mesopotamia. And in doing so, uh, he then moves into his endeavor to build the infamous Tower of Babel. Now, there's a couple of reasons for this, and we'll just review his Nimrod's goals for constructing the tower. One is safety, in case God were to send another flood. He felt that if he built the tower high enough, then he could be preserved during a second flood. The second reason is basically to think of it like a monument to memorialize the pre-flood Nephilim. We even see that today when you know famous people pass away, they'll put up statues and monuments and memorials for these people to remember them by. That's basically what Nimrod was doing. He was building a big giant altar or monument to memorialize the pre-flood world that was wiped away. The third thing is to ascend to heaven to avenge his forefather's death. He was very angry that the seed of the serpent was taken out by God. And he is a descendant of the seed of the serpent. And so he wanted to get revenge, which brings us to number four. He wanted to climb that tower and reach the heavens so that he could wage war on the most high God. Now, I was thinking about this this week, and I feel like the Lord gave me something. Um, obviously, Nimrod was being impacted by the demonic realm and by Satan. And in Isaiah 14, Isaiah actually quotes and tells us what was going on with Lucifer back in heaven during the Luciferian rebellion when he was cast out. And in verse 12, Isaiah says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven, and I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Yea, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, and I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the most high God. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. So this is just a fascinating account where the prophet Isaiah is able to look back in time and describe what was taking place in heaven before the, the first fall. And Lucifer, uh, in his pride and vanity, wanted to ascend into heaven and exalt his throne above the stars of God. And so that is really a very uh, similar perspective of King Nimrod. Nimrod wants to ascend into heaven with his glorious tower and sit at the peak of that tower and be above and exalt himself above God. Now, a couple other things that he was looking to do is this is really the rebirth of the Babylonian Masonic religion. So what better way to popularize your religion than to build a humongous tower for all of the world to marvel over? And it was through the tower that he would go on to master his craft. Now, we've heard that expression before, to master your craft. That actually goes all the way back to the Masons. The Masons are the ones who would build their way up through the initiations and learn all of the uh, sacred geometry and the, and the Masonic symbolism in order to master their craft. And in doing so, they were able to um, use the tower to open up a portal to the higher dimension. And so in that essence, we can think of the Tower of Babel as a stargate or a ancient version of CERN. Now, in the last video, I'd said that the dollar bill is enshrouded with all kinds of Masonic symbolism. We've looked at the origins of it before. There's no doubt that the, the Masons are the ones who put the symbols on the dollar bill. And it's not a coincidence that we're looking at an unfinished pyramid here. Because whenever you look throughout history of the renditions of the Tower of Babel, 
It's referred to as a ziggurat, and ziggurats were always pyramidal in shape. And so this, is, this explains why the, the, the pyramid on the dollar has an unfinished capstone, because we know that God confounded the language before they were able to complete their building project. That explains why there isn't a top on this pyramid. Now, this, this dollar bill, this pyramid on the dollar bill represents the progression, if you will, towards this one world, new world system that's almost upon us. And, and I'll elaborate on that more as we, as we continue on. I'd like to review what Alex Rivera had to say on one of his publications called The Eon Eye. He states that Nimrod himself can be seen as an incarnation of Cain or a torchbearer of Cain's traditions, where Cain went out from the Lord's presence and he lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. He goes on to say that it marked the expansion of the lineage of Cain down through the ages. I think that what Rivera is alluding to is exactly what we've been espousing for a while that Nimrod is directly related to the seed of the serpent. The seed of the serpent was Cain and all of his lineage. And yes, Nimrod is an incarnation of Cain in the sense that it's the same blood and the same genes flowing through Nimrod's veins that were flowing through Cain's veins. And so, yes, Nimrod is the torchbearer carrying on the traditions of Cain. Now, Cain is the very first one who was exiled out of Eden. And he could have gone north or south or east or west, but he chose east. And all throughout the Bible, you'll see that it's the land of the east by which the witchcraft and the sorcery come from. And so east of the promised land is Babylon. And so this is typology and foreshadowing of, uh, of Nimrod's future events. And so he, he goes on to elaborate that the word Babel in the Akkadian term means the gates of the God, which is a reference to the tower as some sort of stargate, as many theologians have speculated, in, in which those building the tower actually wanted to storm the gates of heaven and wage war with God himself. He also goes on to quote the book of Jasher and the Babylonian Talmud, which makes it clear what the goals of the tower building were. There were three different groups involved in the building of the tower, and one said, let us ascend there and dwell there. The second said, let us ascend and serve our idols. And the third said, let us ascend and wage war with God. So it's evident that one of the goals was to try and usurp God in this endeavor. And that is one of the typologies of the last days. In the last days, we are gonna see the beast system and the new world order system, and its goal will be once again to usurp God. Now I'd like to try and just put some things into perspective. You know, I've said in the past that I believe that the book of Genesis and the book of Revelation are highly connected. These are the two bookends to the Bible, but they kind of come together like a lock and a key. And I do believe that time is circular, even though we look at it through a very linear lens. Um, there seem to be a lot of typology in the Bible and you know what comes around goes around. And so just as Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. And we see back before the flood, this genetic contamination of all flesh. And as a consequence of this, the world was destroyed by water. Well, today, 6,000 years later, we're seeing the genetic hybridization of all flesh again. Everything from uh, genetically modified food, uh, we're seeing all kinds of transhumanism experiments being done where they're mixing animal DNA and human DNA. Um, I did a lecture on uh, cell phone radiation and how it's mutating all flesh on the planet. Um, we know that here in the pandemic, uh, people are receiving the, the jab all across the planet and it, it has to do with the RNA and the DNA. And so we're seeing once again, 
genetic hybridization on a level that hasn't taken place since before the flood. And the ultimate genetic hybridization will be when the mark of the beast is issued and people receive that because that will be, uh, that will hybridize them completely and make them part of the Nephilim serpent seed strain. And that's what will prompt the return of the Lord Jesus Christ for the second coming uh, of, of Christ in which he will destroy the world again. So we see some real continuity there. It was the genetic hybridization that led to the destruction the first time, and it will be the genetic hybridization and marring of God's image that will bring destruction upon the planet the second time. We also started with ancient Babylon, a system that was predicated on witchcraft and the occult with the goal of building a one-world system and a one-world tower for a supreme dictator, Nimrod. Well, now, today, we're looking at the book of Revelation, and it describes mystery Babylon. Meanwhile, we're heading towards a one-world global police state, where when you read the 2030 world milestones and you look at Agenda 21, they've made it clear that over the next 10, 20 years, they want to have an electronic digital cashless system. Uh, they want everybody to have digital passports, digital identity. And their ultimate goal is to actually not only have everybody chipped, but to have everybody hooked up directly to the internet so that the whole world is plugged into the matrix and they can actually monitor everything that you do and actually everything that you think. So that ultimately we just have one global collective consciousness in which the Antichrist can take his reign of power over the whole world. And so again, what we saw in the past in Genesis is now beginning to come to fruition in the last days in Revelation. And then lastly, we see very similar parallels today with what was going on in Nimrod's day. Nimrod had figured out how to use the ancient wisdom and technology before the flood from the fallen angels in order to create the Tower of Babel and create the Stargate and commune with the fallen angels and, and open up the, the, the portals. Today we have the same thing. The New World Order has now figured out a way to use high technology through witchcraft and sorcery to invent things like CERN, which is where the World Wide Web actually originated from. And we know that CERN is being used to open up portals to higher dimensions. So as you can see, We've come full circle. Now, there's no doubt in my mind that Nimrod was a Nephilim. The scripture says that he became a Gibberim, and one of the translations for Gibberim is a giant. And when you look at all of the ancient renditions of Nimrod, it always shows a huge man, like we see here on the left, who's holding a lion. He's so big that he makes the lion look like a kitty cat. We also have some famous renditions of Nimrod as a hybrid entity, like we see in the bottom right. Uh, this is known as Nimrod the Bull, and this takes us back to bull worship, which has been going on for millennia. Here we see King Nimrod with angel wings and a bull's body. Essentially, we're looking at a minotaur, very similar to Moloch and Baal, who are also depicted in a similar way. And what I think the symbol clearly reveals is the Genesis 6 hybridization uh, of men and animals and men and angels. And this just helps corroborate the idea that Nimrod was a, uh, a Nephilim. Now, the bull worship is also connected to Saturn worship, the star of Remphan. We see that above with the talisman of Saturn where we have the six-pointed star on one side with the five-pointed star on the back. And we see lots of little sigils written on there. Some of those are connected to the planets. Some of those are connected to the zodiac. And we notice that we have the bull's head in the middle. And so all of this is the, the idolatry that, that was introduced from the fallen angels to the, the people back in Genesis 6. And we know that Nimrod himself was the one who revived all of this. If you recall from previous lectures, um, the story about how Terah 
had built up an inner courtroom with 12 large idols to each of the months of the calendar. And he was the prince of Nimrod's host, and he learned all this from King Nimrod. So it was Nimrod himself who reinstituted the witchcraft, the sorcery, and the idolatry using the six-pointed star and the hexagram. So one of the questions I have is, where exactly did Nimrod learn the pre-flood secrets from? And I think there's a couple of possibilities. The first one would be what I refer to as cellular memory or the DNA. Modern day science and epigenetics has shown that animals have memories from their previous ancestors stored within their genome. And what we're learning through epigenetics is that the DNA is very fluid, it's very complicated, it's an extremely sophisticated storage molecule that can house tremendous amounts of personal data about an individual. And it's very possible that all of your genealogy on both your, your mom and dad's side, meaning that all of the genetic memory of your father, your grandfather, and your great-grandfather going all the way back to the beginning, as well as on your mother's side, is being stored and in the DNA and passed down through the progeny. This is why life is in the blood. And so if that's the case, then perhaps the way that Nimrod was able to revive the pre-flood world is, one, he was a Nephilim. He had the fallen angel DNA, and the DNA has memory in it, and so it just came natural to him. And we know that science has revealed that people who receive organ transplants will actually have memories and thoughts of the individual that they receive the organ from. And so, you know, it's a really fascinating concept, but there is something to cellular memory and DNA. Now, the second one, which I wanna focus on here today, is what the Masonic craft legends teach. And that is that Lamech and Enoch had pillars built and ziggurats built before the flood and that they stored all of the sacred knowledge inside of these ziggurats. And these megalithic structures were so big that they were able to survive the flood so that those on the other side of the flood would have access to this information. And that's an interesting legend that we'll look at in a moment. And then the third way that Nimrod could have revived all of the secret knowledge of the pre-flood world is that it may have been channeled to him. When we've looked at different people in the past lectures, people like George Van Tassel, he was able to produce a fascinating machine called the Integratron, which was a very complex um, device that he made. And it was all based on the telepathic channeling of what he claimed were extraterrestrials from Venus. Same thing with Nikola Tesla. Tesla claims that he was communicating with a higher a supernatural mind that was giving him spiritual downloads of all of the technology that he invented. We've seen this with the Nazis where they were doing seances in order to harvest information from the spirit realm on anti-gravity aircraft. We know that Da Vinci and Pythagoras were deeply involved in the occult. And so, you know, Nimrod could have been communing with the fallen angels and receiving spiritual downloads about all of the sacred knowledge. I'd like to read what Louis Vega wrote in his dissertation on the Stargate Babylon. Vega says, It appears that Nimrod desired to use the sacred geometry and the occult magic of Freemasonry to pierce the veil between his world and the fallen angels with an attempt to produce a doorway for the latter to descend. The Masonic religion of Nimrod has not stopped since the Tower incident to establish such a new world order. Nimrod is attributed to having started the infamous mystery Babylon the Great. How did Nimrod acquire such knowledge to become a Gibberim? It is believed by some accounts that it was by the way of Lamech that built two pillars to house the seven secret sciences of all knowledge of the demigods before the flood of Noah. These pillars were referred to as temples 
or pyramids. They contain the lost knowledge of Enoch, the seventh from Adam, as they knew the flood was coming. So what Vega is saying is that according to craft legends, Lamech was able to build two large giant pillars or ziggurats in which he housed all of the sciences and the secrets within of the demigods of the pre-flood world. And these structures were able to survive the flood, giving people like Nimrod access to it. Vega goes on to say that it does corroborate the similar account of Plato, who has said that there are secrets buried underneath the chambers of Giza where the paws of the Sphinx are at now. And so it's interesting, legend has it that the riddle of the Sphinx, which I believe is another memorial or monument to the pre-flood era with the hybridization. That's why we see the head of a pharaoh superimposed on the body of a lion but supposedly underneath the Sphinx lie these ancient secrets. Vega says that it was said that later on, Tubal Cain, who's also known as Hermes, would discover the secrets, and he began the initiations of the secret societies. It was he who gave access to such knowledge of the pre-flood world to Nimrod. So, for those of you who've been studying the occult for a long time, you're very familiar with Hermes. Uh, Egyptian lore describes Hermes Trigestus. This is where all of the hermeticism of the secret societies come from. The as above, so below paradigm, uh, the Jewish Kabbalah, all of those um, mystical religions are all based on Hermes, who according to craft legends, is another name for Tubalcane. And remember, they use all kinds of rituals involving Tubalcane during their initiation, so there is some potential merit to this. Vega goes on to describe that the secret societies participated in the Feasts of the Beast, which involved sexual intercourse, sex magic rituals, bloodletting, vampirism, and cannibalism. The following are the various permutations of who Nimrod became as this fame and secrets were passed down to present day. Traditionally, the Tower of Babel is described as a literal attempt to build a tower so high that humans could ascend to heaven. However, it was a stargate that could have pierced the spiritual dimensions by mere mortals to attain immortality. Now, that's a very important point. This has to do with alchemy and transubstantiation, trying to uh, do... Uh, occult rituals to convert a mortal man into an immortal man. And this may explain why the King James Bible refers to Nimrod as uh, a man who became a Giborim. It suggests that there was some kind of ongoing process of genetic modification and manipulation that was transpiring through alchemy. Vega says, as noted, Babel uh, means the gate of the gods. Certain locations on earth were built directly on the energy of the ley lines or locations where earth's vortices had maximum potential to pierce the realm of the spiritual interdimensionality. Babylon was and is such a location along the Euphrates River that has this sacred geometry configuration based on the Sidonia Mars triangulation that will play a role in the last days. So what Vega is talking about here is that the planet is magnetized. There's electromagnetic radiation all around the planet. We have a north and south magnetic pole. We know that it's connected to the, the moon and the moon has an impact on the tides and the flow of water, so on and so forth. And there are these ley lines across the planet. In fact, we've looked at this in past lectures. There are an, the, the planet is an entire electromagnetic grid of ley lines, and along the most powerful ley lines is where we see many of the ancient megalithic structures and religious monuments that were being built. They chose these areas because they were the most spiritually primed and charged areas to help um, commune with the spirit realm. 
places like the superstitious mountains in Western United States, places like, you know, in Mexico and in Peru, where all of the ancient structures are built. And what Vega has um, described here is that on Mars, there are also megalithic structures, very fascinating megalithic structures that were built millennia ago. And he claims that these structures triangulate with the structures on planet Earth, in particular, uh, where, where the Babylon and the Euphrates River run. And so, as we can see, there's something very interesting going on with the megalithic structures on planet Earth and, their, and how they're connected to the celestial bodies. He goes on to say that there are numerous other locations around the globe that mirror the same heavenly design and that the Bible and ex other biblical sources attribute such a composition due to the visitation to earth by angelic beings or savior gods or creators who came down and taught humanity the sacred geometry and turned them into initiates of the secret societies. And so, you know, we know that the fallen angels are the ones who introduced the concept of the winter and summer solstice, the patterns of the moon and the sun, and everything to do with the star systems. So therefore, these fallen angels were intimately knowledgeable. They had intimate knowledge of the solar system. And naturally, all of the megalithic structures that the Nephilim would go on to build would have to have some kind of cosmological significance, as we see demonstrated in the three pyramids of Giza, which actually align with the three stars of Orion's belt. So it's pretty fascinating how you can look at topographical depictions of the three pyramids in Egypt, and they line up very clearly with the three stars of Orion's belt. And so this obviously was not done by accident. We know that the star system of Orion and the Pleiades and, and the star Sirius are mentioned all throughout occult writings. And so these are star systems that the fallen angels, the Nephilim, and the hybrids were worshiping before the flood, and they taught this to mankind. Now, what Vega was suggesting is that these, some of these uh, megalithic structures are also, they also triangulate with some of the megalithic structures on the planet Mars, which I think is a very reasonable theory. And, um, you know, it's interesting that these pyramids, nobody knows exactly how old they are. We have what modern day archaeologists have told us. They've told us their narrative. And they believe that these pyramids were built after the flood. But they also believe that a bunch of men in loincloths uh, using copper chisels and hammers would chip away at these 50 ton stones and then drag them along and lever them with um, levers and build these pyramids. And when you look at these pyramids, there's uh, 1 million stones that were used that were quarried. Some of them are 50 to 100 tons in size. Um, they, they make perfect geometrical right angles when they make the stones. Um, they used pi 3.14 to build the structure, and they also had to have knowledge of a compass um, to put it where they did end up putting it in the, in the landmass. And so, you know, I don't believe the narrative that the archaeologists, the modern day archaeologists have shared with us any more than I believe the narrative of evolution that we come from monkeys. And so I believe that these pyramids were likely built before the flood and they were able to survive the flood because of how well built they were designed and they themselves are the fingerprints to the pre-flood world the secrets not only were the secrets housed within these ancient monolithic structures but the monolithic structures themselves are the secrets because it's within the design of all of the megalithic structures around the globe that actually house the, the seven sacred sciences. Now, what Vega was talking about <clears throat> was some of the structures that some of the modern day astronomers have pointed out on the planet Mars. 
we have to keep in mind that some of these structures could have been built many, many millennia ago. And, you know, modern day skeptics say that people just see what they want to see, kind of like looking up at the clouds and you can make out images by looking at the different shapes. And so men are just looking at these images and they're, they're wanting to see things here. But I think that there's some interesting uh, imagery here. We see at the top left, this is referred to as the face of Mars. And you can see the eyes and the nose and the mouth. And they claim that over here to the left was an old ancient city. Even down below, they have what they refer to as the five-sided pyramid. And when you blow it up and look a little closer, like we have here on the top right, some interesting um, architecture here. And they've investigated this geometrically, and they refer to it as the Rosetta Stone. You can see that it has five isosceles triangles used to make the five-sided pyramid. And you know, when you look at it here on the bottom left, the, the, the way that the ridges are made, that doesn't look like something that would develop through erosion and weather and natural patterns. It has too much uh, geometrical shape to it to be uh, a natural event. And so, you know, considering the fact that the fallen angels did come from the higher heavens and they did teach mankind about the sun and the moon and the cycles of the celestial bodies. It means that they had knowledge of the star systems. And, you know, if you go back to the Luciferian rebellion where Lucifer and a third of the angels were cast out and there was a great war in heaven. Um, it was in this time where Lucifer and the fallen angels were cast out of the third heaven where God himself is and cast down to the second heaven, which is space, if you will, and or at least where the planetary bodies are. And so um, is it possible that they were also building megalithic structures on other planets? Now, that's hard for us to put our hands around mentally, but nonetheless, there is some data to suggest just that. Now, we know in Revelation 12, that there's a, another battle between Satan and his angels and Michael. And Satan is cast out of the second heaven down to earth. And it says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, for he knows his time is short. And he comes to um, seek out revenge against the seed of the woman of Jesus Christ. And so I believe that, that's, that when, when Satan and the angels are cast out from that event, that that is the second Thessalonians 2 delusion where the extraterrestrials are going to descend down upon planet Earth and there's going to be a great disclosure of extraterrestrial entities that is going to be the great delusion to lead mankind astray. And so it's definitely very interesting food for thought. Of course, there's going to be a lot of skeptics, but nonetheless, there is some pretty in interesting imagery on Mars. So according to the secret societies and the ancient Masonic craft legends, Lamech built two large pillars and ziggurats, which house all the seven sacred sciences. These were able to survive the flood. And then Nimrod was introduced to this information after. Now we'll see that there are a lot of renditions of these pillars. They, in ancient times, they were referred to as the ancient pillars of Hercules. Now, we know that Hercules is a demigod. This is the Greek mythology about the half-human, half-gods, which we've displayed conclusively is just a, a, a retelling of the pre-flood era. And so we're talking about the same thing here. Now, in these renditions, we see the giant demigod Hercules carrying around these pillars and placing them all around the Mediterranean region uh, to act as monuments and shrines for those in the new world to be able to witness. And throughout the, the ancient times, they actually named the Strait of Gibraltar 
as the pillars of Hercules. And there were pillars placed all throughout that region. And so this ends up becoming adopted by the Masonic religion. And anytime you see any of the Masonic symbolism, you'll always see the two pillars, which would later become the pillars on the front of Solomon's temple. These pillars are named Yachin and Boaz, but we've revealed in the past that these were taken from the Phoenician Canaanites, and they referred to them as the pillars of Hercules. And we know that these pillars of Hercules are supposedly the original pre-flood pillars that housed all of the sacred sciences of the Masonic religion. See, this is the source of all the sacred knowledge that these ancient Masons, remember Nimrod himself was the Grand Master Mason after the flood. Prior to the flood, the Kenite seed line were the Master Masons, starting with Cain, who built the very first city in scripture. Tubal Cain would become a great Master Mason of brass, metal, and copper. And then his, we have in his genealogy also Lamech, and these men were no, no, notable for um, building large structures and, and containing the ancient mysteries and secrets within. And so supposedly these were passed down across the flood through these structures. And that's why when you look at these renditions, these Masonic renditions, you see that you have to pass between the pillars. When you pass between the pillars and you take this narrow path that only few can take and you get to the top and that's where you find the knowledge of the illuminated ones you know you see the sunburst effect at the top in the shape of a pyramid this represents the ancient ziggurats that were built to house all of the secret knowledge along with the pillars of lamech and only the illuminated ones can travel down that pathway through the initiation process where they receive the sacred knowledge. And we see this time and time again throughout Masonic legendary, just as we do over here on the left. Those who are born in the right families and have the right genetics and are part of the royal bloodlines are the ones who will pass between the sacred pillars through the doorway of the royal arch and they'll travel up the initiation pathway until they get to the top where they'll receive the rays of illumination from Lucifer, the light bearer, who casts his false light into humanity's mind. And this is where the as above, so below paradigm comes from, the, from Hermes or Tubal Cain, we see the moon on one side and the sun on the other, and that represents the, the ancient Hermes maxim of as above, so below. And so what we see throughout history is that this was so prominent, the, the Masonic symbols were so prominent, they were all of the leaders all throughout the Dark Ages, all throughout the medieval times, all throughout the Renaissance. They were the 1% royal bloodlines that were the ruling elite. And that's why when you look at all of their money and their coins, you'll see on their coins, just as we see above with the British royal family, the pillars of Hercules, with a large giant here at the Straits of Gibraltar. This is all typology of the royal bloodlines going back to the beginning of time. And this is actually the origin of currency. Now, if you're really interested in the, or, or, uh, the origin of money, uh, Days of Noah, number 30 through 32, we go into very deep, deep detail about you know, the fallen angels introducing the, these things to Tubal Cain, and he becomes the first master mason, and, and he introduces the metals and the currency and, um, and the, the weights and measures. And we go all the way through all of the royal bloodlines and how the currencies were developed. And it's all part of the seed of the serpent, um, leading all the way up even into the days of Jesus, when he confronts the Pharisees and the Sadducees and calls them uh, a generation of vipers because they're in his father's house, the temple, actually trying to make money as a profit from the people for their sins. Uh, during the Passover event, they had to purchase, you know, turtle doves and lambs in order to atone for their sin. And the seed of the serpent in Jesus's day was, was using religion as a way to get rich. 
something that we still see being propagated today. Now I want to try and show you just how deep the rabbit hole really goes. So we have these ancient Masonic legends, these pre-flood pillars that were designed by Lamech, and these ancient ziggurats and pyramids that housed all of the sacred knowledge that was disseminated from the fallen angels. This was a way for the pre-flood world to try and preserve all of the sacred knowledge so that the post-flood world could pick up where they left off. According to them, this is how Nimrod designed Babylon and the Hanging Gardens of Babel and the Tower and the whole, and the whole shebang. He learned these sacred secrets from these ancient megalithic structures. And so this would become known as the infamous Pillars of Hercules. And these pillars would be put on pretty much all of the coat of arms and the currency all throughout the royal bloodlines for the next couple thousand years to the point where when you fast forward even into the time of the Renaissance, you'll see the Spanish coat of arms, which has a lot of classic symbolism. First, you see the pillars of Hercules with a wreath wrapped around it. And then we, of course, we see the royalty here. This represents the royal bloodline. You see the, the dragon, which... I'm going to be doing a future lecture looking at all of the ancient coat of arms, which all of them have dragons on them because they're the royal seat of the serpent and the bloodlines of the Illuminati. But you also see an ancient castle here with the royal arch. And so what we find is that the pillars of Hercules were placed on all of the ancient currency. Here, real Carlos III had the pillars placed on his dollar. Now, what's interesting is over time, they started getting lazy. And instead of drawing the two pillars and putting the wreath around it, they eventually started drawing two dashes and putting a wreath around it. And that is where we get the symbol for the dollar bill. Now, I can assure you that the Masons who designed the dollar bill were very well acquainted with these details. And We've shown in the past that there's just so much occult symbolism on the dollar bill that it's not even funny. We know that the six-pointed star fits perfectly on the seal of the dollar bill, and it's an anagram for Mason. And as I've said before, the six-pointed star is an extremely powerful talisman. I showed it to you earlier when we were looking at the star of Remphan, where it had the image of the bull on the front with a six-pointed star on the front and the pentagram on the back. It's basically one of the oldest symbols for witchcraft, sorcery, and child sacrifice going back to the pre-flood era. And so you have to ask yourself, what a coincidence that we would find ourselves walking around the planet today, 6,000 years later, with a talisman in our pocket that is enshrouded with all of these occult symbols, including a six-pointed star, which is what you use to put a hex on somebody, as well as the pillars of Hercules, which represent all of the ancient knowledge from the pre-flood god men, the demigods. And so what you begin to you know, see is that those who designed America did so with a purpose. That's why when you look at the formation of Washington, D.C., there's a lot of deep occult symbolism and Masonic buildings all throughout. We see it all throughout the dollar bill. We see it through some of the ancient writings, like, for example, Sir Francis Bacon, who is considered to be the father of modern science and, and of the scientific method. In the 1600s, he wrote a book about sailing between the Straits of Gibraltar, known as the Pillars of Hercules, and following the sun to where it's set in the west, because there they would find the new Atlantis that would become the birthplace of where the old Atlantis transpired. In other words, they had imagined that the, the ancient fathers uh, of, of America, the European fathers who really sort of propagated the formation of the United States, they had all dreamed of a day when there would be a new Atlantis formed up in the Western Hemisphere. And Bacon was a very profound occultist. He was in the Rosicrucian Society. He was really steeped in all of the occult and the Masonic mysticism. And just like Manly P. Hall, who wrote The Secret Destiny of America, they all understood that there was always going to be a prophetic destiny 
for America. And, and the prophetic destiny is this, that would help usher in the new Atlantis. And the old Atlantis was the pre-flood world where the demigods ruled un under the one world system. And this is why they've included on the dollar bill the omega symbol above George Washington's head. Because George Washington was the first president of the United States, but the omega symbol, it represents the first and the last. The omega symbol represents the last currency on planet Earth before the final one world currency of the new Atlantis, which in modern terms is the new world order. And so what I've said in the past regarding the dollar is this, if you don't have the Lord in your life and you're not being protected by the power of the Holy Spirit, it's very easy to become mesmerized with the occult power of the dollar. See, the dollar is a charged talisman, and it, it is basically has demonic power um, infused within it in such a way that it can promote greed. And that's why to, in today's world, the whole world is, is, is being run by the dollar. Every single person has to get up and they have to work their, their, as hard as they can to try and make as many dollars as they can to provide for their life. And the Babylonian international bankers have created the credit debt based system so that everybody is so enslaved with debt and credit that they have to continue to work as hard as they can and sell their soul for as many dollars. And so it's very easy to be propagated into a spirit of greed because we have, we're, we're, we're pursuing and carrying around a, a demonically charged and inspired occult object that's you know in each of our pockets. And so make no mistake, the United States is part of the mystery Babylon system of the last days. And they are going to use America to enslave the world. And once they're done with America, they're going to burn it down to the ground along with the dollar, which they're currently doing through radical devaluation. And when they finally bring down the dollar, it'll be out of the ashes of the old, we'll birth the new, and we'll finally move into the final one world electronic digital system. Now, since we're talking about the dollar bill and Nimrod and the Masonic religion, I think it's a perfect time to bring out some imagery from the movie 300. Now, we've already done a lecture on this movie, 300 in the Days of Noah series, if you're interested. It's a pretty fascinating movie that really greatly demonstrates the pre-flood Nephilim and that, that whole world. But look at the very uncanny similarities here. And, you know, I've always said that Hollywood is a very powerful predictive programming. The Satan, the prince of the power of the air, works through Hollywood and television and, and movies and music in order to basically brainwash humanity and, and, and to prepare humanity for what's coming. And so in the movie 300, we see that the king, who is referred to as a god-man, and there's scenes throughout the movie that demonstrate that he's like three or four foot taller than a regular man. So he's kind of like Goliath. He's about a nine foot tall god-man. He represents the Nephilim giants before the flood. And in this account, his name is Xerxes, the king of Persia. But he clearly is the archetype of you know, King Nimrod and the Antichrist, here he stands with his arms folded, demanding only one thing, and that is to be worshipped as a god. Meanwhile, we see this hybrid being down below on his hands and knees, serving the Antichrist system. This is all powerful imagery for the last days. Notice that we have the infamous pillars of Hercules, because it's between the pillars that you ascend up the steps of the unfinished pyramid, where at the top you receive the light of Lucifer or the rays of illumination. Notice that this event is taking place in the darkness. We see the red curtains and the dark, um, you know, it's dark inside of this room. We have the candles being lit with fire and it's demonstrating the occult seances and rituals are taking place. And then we notice that the unfinished pyramid, which obviously represents the Tower of Babel, 
is made in gold. And we know that gold represents divinity. And so what's being demonstrated here is this very powerful understanding. Uh, and, and it's not a coincidence that this looks very similar to the seal and the dollar bill, because those who worship the dollar are going to end up worshiping the beast system. And eventually they're going to end up serving the new and revived Nimrod. Now we're coming to the end of the lecture, but I thought this was a very appropriate uh, final image to display. This is an image of Nimrod right here. This is an image of what the Nephilim stand for. This is an image of what the future Antichrist looks like. He's a hybrid male. Um, you can see that he has red demonized eyes and you know he's covered in all of the jewels and the gold and uh, he sort of has this pyramid looking shape and what's being demonstrated in this image is that he's coming for all of us and we are all going to be forced to we're, we're all going to be looking down the barrel one day of this guy king nimrod who is going to be resurrected in the last days as the person of the antichrist you can see on the left and on the right what he's interested in you have all of these souls who are bowing down totally prostrate on the floor with their nose and their face to the ground in complete submission to the the king and so you know nimrod and his Tower of Babel, where the whole world was united in one accord, that is typology of the New World Order, one world system in the last days. And that system is upon us now. And in my opinion, the only way that you're going to be able to stand up against that system that's upon us is if you're walking in the power of Jesus Christ. If you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've been born again and filled with the Holy Spirit, then the Lord can supernaturally guide you through the very challenging times that still lie ahead. And the reason that you need to be born again is because all of our flesh bodies have been contaminated. The scripture says that we were born in iniquity, that uh, there are no righteous, not even one that live on the planet, that there is, Paul says that there is the spirit of of uh, the law of the flesh versus the law of the spirit, that our spirit wages war with our flesh and our flesh wages war with our spirit. And you have to ask yourself, why is it that we're born in iniquity? Why is it that we're born inside of a sinful fleshly body that has been genetically programmed to both sin and die? And the answer has to do with the garden. The answer has to do with the fact that the serpent snuck into the garden and he began the contamination process and later we see that the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent are intermixing over and over and over both before and after the flood until we eventually come to a point in humanity where all flesh is contaminated and so just as it says in the book of corinthians that the mortal body must put on immortality and that this mortal body must perish because it cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven the reason that our bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven is because there is a genetically contaminated virus that's been placed in humanity that comes from the serpent. And so the only way to overcome that is to receive the Holy Spirit. And the, the best way that I could describe it, it would be like a computer. If you have a hard drive that's been infected with a virus, um, if you could download antiviral software, and upload that software into the hard drive, you could, you could now have a new software on that computer. The computer is still contaminated, but at least it has new software within the computer. And that would be analogous to our bodies and the Holy Spirit. Our flesh bodies have been contaminated and they are programmed to sin and they are programmed to die. That's for all of us. But when we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, that's like putting new software inside of our hardware. And that software, the Holy Spirit can give us power to overcome sin and death. And so I pray that uh, each of you continue to draw closer to God and you allow the power of the Holy Spirit to work in your life.
And so we're going to move to the last final slide. Um, but before we go, just take a, a, a good look into those cold, dark eyes and ask yourself, what exactly is he coming for? And the answer is obvious. He wants your soul. He is coming for our soul. And it's up to us to make a decision who we're going to serve. Everybody serves somebody. You're either going to serve the world and the Antichrist system that's being built. Or you're going to serve God the Father and his son Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. But you can't serve both. The Bible says you cannot have two masters. So we all have free will. We're all going to have to make a decision of who we serve. So we're coming to the final slide. And I'm going to go ahead and give you a spoiler alert on the next video. The next video is going to be on a really fascinating movie. It's a pretty famous movie that was made in the late 1970s. So the movie is over 40 years old. And if you're looking at the image on the right, then you probably guessed it. It's none other than Conan the Barbarian with uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger as the main star. And the reason that I've chosen this movie, first of all, I believe that the Lord led me to this movie as a great confirmation of these lectures. But what you'll find about this movie is that it is completely enshrouded in everything that we've been talking about. Everything from magic, witchcraft, sorcery, human sacrifice, all of the Masonic architecture and symbolism, as well as prophecies. And then even more interestingly, the whole movie is dealing with a serpent cult. And eventually we even see shape-shifting reptilians come out in the movie. And so I believe that it is truly a fascinating representation of Nimrod and the days of Babel. And as we see here on the right, Arnold Schwarzenegger represents the large, giant, demigod, Hercules-style man who's able to wield the, the steel and use the metals. And so that'll be our next lecture. I think that'll be a fun one. Um, I was thinking about, you know, the people who produced and directed the movie, and it reminded me of something that Kenneth Grant had once said. Now... For those of you not aware of who Kenneth Grant is, he was a deep occultist and a, a high-level magus, which is a, a, a wizard or a magician. He was the predecessor of Aleister Crowley. Um, uh, Crowley was his mentor. And he wrote many books. And uh, he also was in contact with H.P. Lovecraft, who was another deep occultist. And Kenneth Grant discussed something that he referred to as the Typhonian Current. And this is a really important and fascinating thought that I want to leave the listeners with. The Typhonian Current is a thing where these myths about the old ones, the ancient ones, the, the days of Atlantis, that these are stories of the inner worlds psychic realities that are being awakened by the magic, an ancient current of force that dwells within the unconscious mind of humanity in such a way that the occultists, the left-hand path workers who pursue these myths are able to tap into this same magical current and con consciousness. Now, what he's saying here is essentially this. All of the ancient legends and, and all of the myth and all of the lore about Hercules and the Godmen and all of the uh, pre-flood world, that all is stained within the consciousness of humanity through the DNA, through our brains, through our genetics. And Kenneth Grant and H.P. Lovecraft coined it as the Typhonian Current, and they said that it was an ancient current of force that was like a psychic reality within the unconscious mind of humanity. In other words, I don't believe that the people who produced and directed the movie Conan the Barbarian were actually conspiring together to try and make a movie about the days of Nimrod with all of the occult mysticism. 
but rather they had just tapped into this Typhonian current. See, people who are not closely walking with the Lord and who have the power of the Holy Spirit in their life, then they have the spirit of this world working through them. And, you know, they may have been dabbling in the occult. They may have been in the New Age movement. They may have been in Eastern mysticism, whatever it is. They've opened themselves up to this supernatural, sophisticated spirit of the planet. And they tapped into the Typhonian current. And it's the magic current that ends up weaving and working through the minds of the producers and the directors and the actors in such a way that we see art imitating life being produced on the screen or on the book or on the music. And so it's just a really fascinating uh, process. And, you know, the Typhonian current was being demonstrated in this book here called The Dark Lord, which is a book about the planet Saturn. And you see that it's writings that blend together H.P. Lovecraft and Kenneth Grant. But they show the Typhonian current being displayed with the imagery here of the planet Saturn. We see here that there's the planet Saturn and, and there's a spiritual, spiritual archon or fallen angel who's actually holding the planet Saturn. And he has horns and angel wings. And we see the six-pointed star or the star of Saturn or the star of Remphan on his forehead where the pineal gland is. And it ends up uh, going down to the planet Saturn where there's a vortex being opened up through the spheres of Saturn. And we see the Kundalini serpent spirit being used through guided meditation to open the, the, the Saturn. And so all of this is uh, just deep witchcraft and mysticism through the Typhonian current that's being used throughout all of the people on the planet to continue to propagate all of these concepts. Um, last night I was just thumbing through the television and, and there were about five different movies on and every single one of them either had to do with extraterrestrials, the new age movement or transhumanism. And so this Typhonian current is being manipulated all throughout planet earth so that people are being brainwashed to receive this new age that's upon us. And uh, I just want to bring it to your attention so that you're familiar with it. If you're interested in more about this book here, The Dark Lord, then uh, go in the Days of Noah series. And we have a couple of lectures dedicated to it and the planet Saturn. But that's it for today, folks. Godspeed. And we'll see you on the next one. Get ready for the next video, which will be on uh, the movie Conan the Barbarian. Bye-bye.